please take the word of God and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16, you'll find it on page 249 in the Old Testament. One Samuel chapter 16. A moment of prayer before we get into the scriptures. Lord our God, thank you for your holy word. Thank you that it is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. Thank you that it pierces to the dividing of soul and spirit that it discerns the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. Nothing is hidden from you, Lord, for everything is open and laid bare before your eyes. And so grant that your word would search us and speak to us and encourage us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, Irene and I were in Zambia visiting my cousin and his wife who own and operate a fabulous farm about five hours north of Lusaka. And uh, my cousin serves on a number of government boards and committees in Zambia, particularly relating to the agricultural and wild, wildlife sectors. And he's currently chairing a search committee to find a director for a very important uh, government department. And on the day that we arrived, they had interviewed seven potential candidates for that position, and on the day after we left, he had another nine lined up for interviews in Lusaka. And I could tell that while we were together, he was rather preoccupied with the, the weight of this responsibility of finding just the right person for, for that position. Choosing people to fill key positions is a very, very weighty responsibility. It's a task that um, Irene and I sometimes have when young couples come to us and ask for advice about marriage. Uh, it's a bit of a tricky thing when someone says to you, do you think I should marry her? How do you answer that? Um, if you say no and they go ahead and get married, they'll hate you for the rest of your life. And if you say yes and it turns out to be not a good marriage, they'll still hate you for the rest of their life. So it's a bit of a no-win situation and you kind of feel the weight of that responsibility. I tend not to give uh, answers that are too direct uh, most of the time. As a church, we're currently in the throes of finding my successor and the elders who constitute the core committee are deeply aware of the important responsibility that we have as we consider name after name that has been suggested to us by some of you and that have come, suggestions that have come from, from other quarters. And uh, each time we meet, there's a sense in which these men are being paraded before us, not literally, but we are talking about people. And uh, as one name comes to us, we have to decide, does this name go into the D bucket, which means definitely not, or does it go into the C bucket, which means probably not, or does it go into the B bucket, which means maybe, but we maybe need to do a bit more homework, or does it go into the A bucket, which means, wow, we see potential here and we need to perhaps pursue this to see if God is in it. And that's the, that's the, the job that we're involved in as a core committee at the moment. Selection. It's a very, very challenging process. Whether it's selecting a life partner, whether it's hiring someone in your business, whether it's appointing a new senior pastor, now, the passage before us this morning in this final message in our series on the life of Samuel is about selection. And chapter 16 is about God choosing a king to succeed King Saul. It's a chapter that marks a major transition in the books of First and Second Samuel. Because up to now, um, 
Eli and Samuel and Saul have been the main characters. But from this chapter on, David becomes the main character all the way through. It's a very, very important chapter. Now, the coming of David was alluded to earlier in 1 Samuel. It was mentioned in chapter 13, verse 14, no name, but the fact that God had someone in mind to take over from Saul. It was mentioned again, we saw last week in chapter 15 and verse, 20, and verse 28. But, but now the sacred text turns directly to talk about David, Israel's great champion, poet, prophet, king, and importantly, type or picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we unpack this story of selection, there is one key principle that is going to stand out, the key text in the passage, and arguably the key text in First and Second Samuel, is verse seven of the chapter in front of you. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. We'll come in a moment to see who he's talking about. And then this, the final sentence in verse seven, or the final two. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So this passage is about seeing as God sees. It teaches us that it's the heart that really matters. So we wanna begin by becoming acquainted with the background to the Lord's choice. And as we step into the chapter, the first thing we hear is the Lord rebuking Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? You'll remember that Israel, unlike the surrounding nations, had been a theocracy. God was their king and he ruled through priests and judges, men like Eli and Samuel. And when Samuel was an old man, you remember, he appointed his sons as judges. What a disaster. His sons, we read in chapter eight, verse three, did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. I don't know that he knew that when he appointed them, but he obviously didn't check their hearts out too well because it was only a matter of time before what was in their hearts was manifest in their behavior. So the people were disillusioned and they wanted something done about it. They wanted a king. And so the leaders of the people, the elders of the people, you remember, came together and had a summit at Ramah, which was Samuel's home. And they said to him, in essence, Samuel, there are three reasons why we want a king. Number one, you're old. Number two, your sons are a disaster. And number three, all the other nations have kings and it seems to be working for them and we want to be like them. We want a king. People always have a tendency to want to be like everybody else. And Samuel saw their request for what it was. He saw their request as a rejection of the Lord and it broke his heart. So he goes to God in prayer and the Lord said to him, chapter eight, verse seven, listen to all the people are saying to you, it is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. And so the people of Israel got the king they wanted. And you remember, he was every inch a king. He was tall, he was dark, he was handsome, he was a hunk of a man. And interestingly, he seems to have begun reasonably well. And under his leadership, some good things happened, particularly uh, military victories were, were won, but it wasn't time, it wasn't too long before what was in his heart became evident in his behavior. The sins of impatience, presumption, greed, 
disobedience, hypocrisy, pride, cowardice, all of those things began to surface. And then there were two flagrant acts of disobedience recorded in chapter 13 and then the one we looked at two weeks ago in chapter 15. And God eventually said, enough is enough. And Samuel, you remember, announced to Saul that God had rejected him as king. And Samuel was heartbroken. We read in 1535 that he mourned for Saul. Why? Well, he, he had mentored him. He had loved him as a son. He had confronted him when he had done wrong. He tried to correct him. And he mourned because of the people. He mourned because of the effect that poor leadership was having on the nation. Sounds familiar. A nation being led by someone who was unfit to lead and Samuel mourned because of that. So even though, in a sense, God rebuked Samuel for his ongoing mourning, and there's definitely a, a note of rebuke in verse one, how long will you mourn for Saul since I've rejected him as king? God was about to do a new, a glorious thing, and he wanted Samuel to be part of that, so he was saying, Samuel, the time has come to look forward and to stop looking back. But on the other hand, there's something noble about Samuel's grief, something proper about his grief, something commendable and instructive in his distress. And I asked myself and I ask you, do, do, we, do we know what it is to mourn? Uh, are you mourning over the conditions of our country? I hope so. I hope so, and I hope that that morning will find expression in prayer, not just on Tuesday on a, a special day of prayer, but I hope that you will mourn for our country. I hope that you will mourn for other countries that are in trouble. Do we grieve over the indifference to God and his glory in our society in general? Do we grieve over the sins of fellow Christians, or, we just, or do we just gossip about them? Do we grieve for marriages that are breaking and for believers that are backslidden? Do we grieve over the level of biblical illiteracy in the church and in society? Samuel mourned, and I think that there was a rightness to his mourning, even though there was time now to look forward and move with God to the next thing. So while the aged Samuel was mourning at his home in Ramah, God spoke to him and he gave him a command. Look at it, second part of verse one. God said to him, fill your horn with oil and be on your way. They used to carry oil in an animal's horn. They would hollow it out and use it as a receptacle and plug up the one end like we would use a bottle Fill your horn with oil, God said, and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse, a man's name in this case. Jesse, interestingly, was the grandson of Ruth and Boaz. You remember the story of Ruth. He was of the tribe of Judah. That's significant. Saul was a Benjamite. Jesse was of the tribe of Judah. So God says, I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. Does that ring any messianic bells? And God says, I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Another translation, I think a better translation is, I have provided for myself a king from among his sons. I love that. God says, I have provided for myself a king from among his sons. But Samuel said, how can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. He was not wrong in his assessment of Saul's reaction. But it seems for a moment that he did what we are prone to do. He took his eyes off God and he looked at the problem. The Lord took no notice of his objections and fears and he says to him in the second part of verse two, Take a heifer with you. 
Now, some of you who don't have an agricultural background may not know what a heifer is. So I need to explain in the best Chinese I'm capable of. A heifer is a young cow. <laughs> okay? Dad, you're awake. A heifer is a young cow. Take a young cow with you and say to the people of Bethlehem, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do, God said. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Verse four, Samuel did what the Lord said. And when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Now, why do you suppose the townsfolk in Bethlehem were so afraid when they heard that Samuel was coming to town? They should have been filled with joy at the prospect of a, of a pastoral visit, but they weren't. They were filled with fear instead. And I think we can understand why. They would have been aware of the of the rift that had taken place between Samuel and Saul. Samuel had just declared that Saul had been rejected and Samuel had gone his way and he never, we saw in the last verse of, the, of chapter 15, uh, they never saw each other again. Now if the people of Bethlehem were aware of that, they would have thought, uh-oh, if we welcome Samuel, we're gonna be in trouble with Saul. And so their fears were legitimate. Maybe they also thought, well, maybe Samuel is coming in judgment. Maybe they heard about what he did with Agag. You remember the king of the Ammonites, how he hacked him in pieces before the Lord? I mean, that's not the kind of guy you want to have to dinner. But Samuel assures them that there's nothing wrong. And soon their anxiety turns to anticipation. He told them that he'd come to lead in a festival of worship to the Lord. They were going to sacrifice and then they were going to eat together and worship the Lord. He was not coming as an agent, as an agent of judgment. That's the background to the Lord's choice. So the heifer was killed, sacrifice was made, the portions of meat that were to be eaten were separated from the portions that were offered to God and everything was ready. Now let's move into verses six and seven and explore the wisdom in God's choice. We've seen the background to the choice, now the wisdom in the Lord's choice. God had, cho had told Samuel that he had chosen one of Samuel's sons, I mean one of Jesse's sons, to succeed Saul. But, but which one? He had eight sons, lucky man. And so after consecrating Jesse and his sons, which probably involved some kind of ceremonial washing that would be required to, to bath and then put on clean clothes, uh, kind of an outward symbol of inward heart preparation for worship. So after that cleansing or consecrating ceremony, he brought them before Samuel one by one beginning with the eldest, and Samuel had the task of selection, the task of indicating which one was God's choice. If you look at verse six, you'll notice that Samuel himself very quickly made a choice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. Eliab was obviously tall and impressive in appearance. Uh, first part of verse seven indicates that. Uh, like Saul, you remember, he looked the part. Samuel should have learned his lesson from what happened with Saul, but he didn't. Saul's outward appearance was deceiving. And Samuel very quickly says, ah, oh, Eliab's our man. Look at him. He looks very kingly. He must be the guy, imposing, domineering. And so he thought to himself, 
Surely the Lord's anointed stands before the Lord. And I think like Samuel, we are prone to judge in wrong ways. We're prone to judge by outward appearance. We're prone to be impressed by looks, by talent, by dress, by experience, by personality, by degrees, by education, by what's on a person's CV. And people choose marriage partners on the basis of externals. And people hire employees on the basis of externals. And churches appoint leaders and call pastors on this basis as well. And on the matter of calling pastors, Dale Ralph Davis, who has served as a pastor and a seminary professor, one of the great writers on Old Testament uh, historical books, says this, what we seem to want are the movers and shakers, the aggressive extroverts, the pushers who meet people well and sell the church in a community, who are smooth in the pulpit. Do we ever ask, how does he pray? Does he enjoy being with his wife? Can he weep? Kenneth Chafin on similar vein says, like Samuel, we too can be impressed by the things that can be seen with the physical eyes. Consequently, we live in a world where physical beauty outranks spiritual depth, where success in business and in the church tends to be defined in materialistic terms, and where charisma is more important than character. So Samuel made a choice based on externals. But now God brings a correction in verse seven. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. So the one Samuel chose, God said, uh-uh, not him. Samuel had been considering the wrong things. He was using the wrong measure, incorrect criteria. Then God went on to give Samuel a principle that governs who he chooses and who he uses. And here it is, verse seven. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And God drove that principle into Samuel's heart at that point. Gordon Keddy said, however great our wisdom, however fine our ability to judge character, we're always at best looking on the outside. We read the outward evidence of people's lives and read into their motives. But the truth is we cannot read the heart. God alone is the searcher of our inner being. We are limited to extrapolating from what we can see into what we can never see. Only God sees it all. Samuel, discerning a man as he was, could not tell whom God would choose to be king. And God humbled him by telling him the truth about the limitations of human finite discernment. I hope we get it. God looks below the surface. He sees what people don't see. He's not impressed by the things that people are impressed by. He looks past good looks, past talent, past the CV, past the track record. He looks at the heart, the inner motives and desires and trajectory of a, person, of a person's heart. Richard Phillips says something that I think is helpful to us in our call process and helpful in any selection process. He writes, it is because of his superior insight and wisdom that God wanted to be the one to provide Israel's king. This is also why God wants to raise up leaders for the church today by his own calling. When churches are approving leaders, we need to strictly follow the criteria given in the word of God, all of which are spiritual qualifications. 
lacking our own wisdom, we need to obey God's word. God's word particularly that spells out the qualifications of leaders in 1 Timothy and Titus. Lacking our own wisdom, we need to obey God's word. In doing this, we are especially warned against the impressiveness of external appearances. How difficult it is for us to see through a carefully managed first impression, attractive clothes, or the appearance of success. To follow the biblical guidelines is not easy. It takes time and discernment to assess character, values, and true beliefs. And we need to pray for God's help and God's wisdom. And we need to seek to look upon the heart. And that applies across the board in the matter of selection. And I hope that particularly as we relate it to our own church, that you'll pray that God would give your core committee that kind of discernment. Now let's turn from the wisdom in the Lord's choice, and I want us to look together at the surprise in the Lord's choice in verses eight to 12. So after the Lord taught Samuel the principle of choice, uh, the process continued. Look at verse eight. Then Jesse called Abinadab, and made him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then made Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. Huh, reminds me of the court committee. One by one, they pass by. But the, so the parade was over, and Samuel's bewildered. I mean, had he not heard God? Did not, hadn't God said, one of Jesse's sons, and he looks at all of them, and none of them get the nod from God? And uh, so he says to Jesse, verse 11, are, all, are these all the sons you have? And Jesse replies, they're still the youngest, Jesse answered, but, but he's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down. We will not sit down to eat. I'm sure that's what that means. Until he arrives. In other words, no shepherd, no food. And when the bry is on and you can smell the meat, I mean, that is uh, a hard thing. So a servant is dispatched out to the pastures. We're not sure how far away from the house David was tending the sheep, but the servant is dispatched to call young David back to the house. And this is where David's sheep tending is interrupted, and pretty soon he finds himself standing in the family home before his father, before his seven brothers who might have had their uh, noses out of a joint because they were not chosen, and the prophet Samuel. He is described, David is described in verse 12 as ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. I'm so glad that that was put in the scripture because it reminds us that God has nothing against good looks. They're just not the main thing. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He is the one. Rise and anoint him. He is the one. The runt of the litter. He is the one. Years later, the psalmist Asaph wrote these words, God chose David his servant and took him from the sheep pens, from tending the sheep. He brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. Jesse, David's father, hadn't even bothered to invite him to the feast. He doesn't even use his name. He just says, oh, there's the young one out and it, it's, the Hebrew is it's almost a derisive, almost a dismissive, 
And in the message, it's translated, he is the runt, or the runt is out in the fields. In their eyes, he was fit for tending sheep, but God had chosen him to be the shepherd of his people. This is the one. This shepherd boy will become Israel's king. It's completely unexpected. It's a surprise. A small boy from a small town, Bethlehem, anointed to be the greatest king of Israel and a picture in many ways of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the one. You think of Jesus, you remember what Nathaniel said? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Jesus was from Nazareth. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Can a carpenter be the Messiah? Isaiah says, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. parallel, the surprise of God's choice. I remember my old teacher at Bible College, Mr. Maxwell, in his 80s after leading that college for in excess of 50 years, one day said, one of the things that has surprised me most is that the students who were the most promising, who appeared to be the most promising in Bible College were not the ones who made the greatest impact in the world. It was the ones that were, some of the ones that were least noticed who ended up having the greatest impact. And God kind of does that. He surprises us with his choices. Now what did God see in David? What was it about David that God saw that led to that choice? I think the key thing he saw in David was a submissive heart, a heart submissive to God. In 2 Chronicles 69, which is a verse you need to memorize, it says this, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the whole earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. God is looking for people whose hearts are fully committed to him so he can empower them and use them. And as he looked over those brothers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, it was number eight who had a heart like that. God had said to Saul, but now your kingdom will not endure the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. So Saul's disqualification was around a lack of submissiveness of heart. And that's what God found and saw in David, a submissiveness of heart. In Acts 13, 22, Paul reflected on God's choice of David in these words, after removing Saul, he made David their king. He testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to. Now, being a man or a woman after God's own heart doesn't mean sinlessness. Subsequent events in David's life will show that he was not sinless but it basically means that he had a submissive heart, a heart that was surrendered to God, a heart in which there weren't locked cupboards where he was saying to God, keep out of that area of my life. I remember reading about F.B. Meyer, that great Baptist preacher in Manchester who once said that there was an area of his life that he was not willing to surrender to God and God just kept pressing him in that area and said, I want the key to that room in your heart. And he resisted, he struggled, but God kept pressing him. 
and he had no peace until he had surrendered what he called the last key. I'm sure it wasn't the, the last, because all of us have many rooms in our hearts, and part of Christian growth is letting God take over the lordship of every area of our lives. Only Jesus had a heart fully surrendered to God. Only of him could it be said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. But he's looking for men, he's looking for women, he's looking for young people. David was a boy. He was a boy, a shepherd boy. And God looked in his heart and he saw a heart fully committed to him. And I ask you this morning, what is your heart like? When God looks into your heart and he does, what does he see? Does he see a heart committed to him? Or does he see a heart in which he's in one little compartment but the rest you're in control of and you're holding the keys? What does he see as he looks into your heart? The heart is so critical. It affects everything. There's an, God appeals in Ecclesiastes. My son, give me your heart. My daughter, give me your heart. Have you given your heart to God? Isaiah rebuked God's people. He said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And we can stand here and we can sing songs and we can raise our hands and we can have a wonderful worship venue. But God says, that doesn't mean a fig to me if your heart is not right. My son, my daughter, give me your heart. I ask you this morning, does God have your heart? He is not impressed by the externals. I can be impressed by the externals of your life. I can think, oh, you're doing all this tick, 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 therefore everything's fine. God, God isn't fooled by that. He looks at our hearts. The final verse in the section is one in which we see the sign of the Lord's choice. Look at verse 13. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Interesting, that word could be translated, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him almost a, a Pentecostal overtone, a rushing mighty wind. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. From that day on, his life was characterized by the presence and power of God's Holy Spirit. The Lord was with him. In Psalm 89, God is quoted as having said, I have found David my servant. With my sacred oil, I have anointed him. My hand will sustain him. Surely my arm will strengthen him. I love it. I found him. I've anointed him with my spirit and my hand will sustain him and my arm will strengthen him. And from that day on, we see evidence of God's grace and power in David's life for two things. For suffering and for service. Even though David was anointed king in chapter 16, he didn't become king until 2 Samuel chapter two. There were many years lay between that anointing and his being crowned king. Saul continued to reign and inflamed with jealousy and uh, uh, dogged by fits of depression, he hunted and hounded David. If you want some interesting reading for Sunday afternoon, better than the Sunday Times, definitely better than the cricket. Read from chapter 16 through to 2 Samuel chapter two. I mean, the drama as Saul sets out to hunt and hound David in the caves over the rocks. I mean, it's, it's high drama. It's the stuff movies are made of. And he, he, he was just a, a step away from death again and again and again. It was tough, 
He suffered, his family suffered, lost everything, exiled into Amalekite territory, came back to find his whole home burned, his family taken away. I mean, and all the way through, you see the sustaining hand of God. And then he becomes king. And you see God's power enabling him to serve. And then you think of Jesus, David's greatest son, the one to whom David pointed. David was a signpost to Jesus. And you look at the life of Jesus. He comes up out of the waters of baptism in the Jordan. Heavens are torn open. The Holy Spirit descends on him and anoints him. What happens next? The Holy Spirit drives him into the desert, into the wilderness, like David. And so you have wilderness, you have the enemy, you have temptation, you have wild beasts. Read about it in Mark chapter one. You have angels coming and attending to him. 40 days of testing. And then his period of service begins and it's no different for you and me. When you become a Christian, God gives you his Holy Spirit. He anoints you with his Spirit. First John talks about that. You have received an anointing from the Holy One. Why? To suffer and to serve. The last line in chapter 13 is worth looking at. After the account of David's anointing by Samuel with oil and by the Holy Spirit comes this final sentence. Samuel then, after he had done what God had wanted him to do, Samuel then went to Ramah. That was his home. So we could say Samuel then went home to Ramah. He had done his job. He had identified and anointed God's king. And then we read in chapter 25, verse one, now Samuel died and all Israel assembled and mourned for him and they buried him at his home in Ramah. He died and was mourned by God's people because he had faithfully served God and them in the turbulent times of transition from the judges to the monarchy. And he died having been taught a most important lesson. Perhaps if you had visited him in Rama before he died and you'd found him sitting on his patio in his rocking chair with a cup of tea in his hand. And if you'd said to him, Prophet Samuel, if you could give me one key lesson that you learned in the course of your ministry, what would it be? What's the most important thing you've learned that you could pass on to me? I think he would have said this. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. I think that's what he would have said. Let's never forget it. Let's pray. Lord our God, we thank you for this servant of yours, Samuel. Thank you that one day, we shall meet him in heaven. Thank you for your grace on him and in him and through him. And thank you for teaching him this important lesson which we pray we will embrace and live by The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks 
at the heart. Oh God, give us a heart like David. Make us men and women after your own heart. Amen.